everybody. Welcome. It's nice to see you all. Hi. Um, so we are here today. I'm Emily Beach. Uh, and I'm here today with the wonderful Paul Dudbridge. Hello. Hello, thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for joining us on our lovely red sofas. Lovely, isn't it? Social distancing. <laughs> yes, exactly, of course, we are. Um, yes, so we're very excited to have you join us today. We are at Springboard uh, in Horsham, which is a stay and play centre. Um, and those of you might know that we do, we do a lot of work with them here at Silvertip Films. Um, so yes, check them out. They are taking bookings uh, online, so you can come and join. Come and join in the play. Um, so, yes, we're here with Paul Dudbridge, very exciting. He is filmmaker and author of this wonderful book, Making Your First Blockbuster, um, and also Shooting Better Movies. Um, now, I did actually try and buy this book uh, on, on Amazon, am I allowed to say? On Amazon. And um, it was sold out, Paul. Happy days. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's lockdown for you. Yeah, that yeah. is. So, um, basically, Paul is going to be giving away this amazing book. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so we're going to ask you some questions, but more about that in a, in a little bit. Uh, we'll ask you a, a question and then you can comment um, in the box, in the comment box. Um, and then, yeah, we'll, I think Paul will pick his favourite answer. Very exciting. So, uh, Paul, we'd love to know a bit about yourself. So if you'd like to just say hello and introduce us. Sure. Well, yeah, I'm Paul. I'm a producer and director doing independent film and TV uh, and a few TV commercials. Uh, I also teach in my downtime when I'm not shooting. I sort of do, you know, go around the film schools and, and universities. Uh, and I've written two books, so, yeah. Amazing. Not, not, not a lot, then. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm trying to fit it all in. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, so we're going to have lots... So if anyone has any questions, please, please, please do comment um, and we will speak, we'll sort of get the com uh, questions up as we go. Um, but first of all, I've got some questions for you, Paul. Okay, sorry. Um, now, actually, we were having a big chat earlier and you were saying that you, from these sorts of interviews, you do love to make sure that the people watching get something to take away with them. Yes. So we're going to make sure that we do, right? We're not sure. Just gonna... I think, yeah, I just think take, having takeaway is something, something that you can use in your filmmaking rather than just background on the person and where they went to school and how they yeah. got into their job. Something that they can use, sort yeah. of something hands-on. Yeah, I like that myself, so Great. hopefully we can provide we'll a bit just of that. just be finding out about your childhood then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, well, on that note, we're sure. going to actually go delve straight in. Okay. Um, and I'm going to ask you a little bit about script writing. Okay. Um, I guess the biggest thing when you might sit down to thinking about a film is, like, you need an idea first. That's the first sure. possible, right? Sure, sure. So where do, where do you get your ideas from? Uh, well, I think... It's worth, it's worth noting that an idea doesn't kind of come out fully formed. I think, you know, sometimes we look at other people's films and go, wow, how do they come up with that? And actually, it starts off as a little bit of a nugget of something, and, you know, a small idea that you then build on. Yeah. Uh, I like to do that myself where I, I might have an access to a location or uh, some sort of story pops into my head and I go, well, how can I, how can I add something to that to make it interesting? And normally it's like, what conflict can I bring in? Um, for example, I did a film, a short film, um, about 10 years ago, and it was about a young prostitute who decides to take herself back to school to kind of get her life back on track. And I was thinking, OK, so how could we then, what other mm. thing can we add to that idea? What conflict can we bring in? And it was, I thought, well, how about if one of her clients is a teacher at the school? Oh. And, and it's like, right, how's that going to work? Yeah. And then you have this question that then gets asked, well, what happens if the other kids find out? So there's this question that needs to be answered. And I mean, I'm developing a film at the moment, which is a Western, which I'm quite excited about. I've got this location over in southern Spain. Uh, I've got this town, and I want to shoot the Western, but what's the story? How could we, what could we do with that? Um, and I've got like a background in visual effects and things like that. So I'm thinking, OK, could we do a haunted town? Yeah. Could a sort of haunted Western? So then how do our characters go there? What's the reason for it? What conflict can we bring in? So that's where my ideas kind of come from. Take something that you, you, you know, some nugget of an idea and then add something to it that will cause a friction. Like, yeah, you some need, kind you need of like an obstacle, right? Yeah, mm. and, and I think, and it could just be like, oh, I've got access to a location, so I'm going to set my film there. And then it becomes what characters can we yeah. have in that location to inhabit the environment? I yeah. think in my head, I'd be a bit of, um, I don't know, I'd, I'd find that like maybe my stories just didn't link or it would be a bit of a mess. <laughs> sure. Well, I think it's nice to have like a, a you know, kind of, I, I, I like to have like an, 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 what I call an inevitable scene where something's leading to something else. Mm. So like, uh, you know, like, like I mentioned earlier, that short film about the prostitute, it's, it's only a matter of time before the kids find out. Right. So we're aiming for that scene. Also, what happens? How does the story end? 
and it's like it's either going to be this, this, or this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and one thing I've, I've read a long time ago is a really good book called Bambi versus Godzilla, which oh. which is a great book. And, and the writer of that was saying, when you come to a conclusion of a movie or a novel, you want to pick the third option. Okay, so that's the first option, the second option, but what's the third? And he uses a joke, I think he says something like, in, in the joke, do you wake up grumpy in the morning? The answer is either yes, no, or the third answer is I let him sleep in. Because ah. they're obviously referring to the wife's husband. So your, the end to a film is always good if it's the third option. That's so interesting. Yeah, rather wow. than it being the first two, which are probably predictable and the audience have already guessed. It's like thinking, making yourself think outside the box. For the yes. Third third option yeah. yeah so find the third option and that might bring, make your story that more is interesting. amazing yeah. oh wow that's so interesting um so regarding characters sure. um what sort of tips do you have for creating interesting characters well they've got i think they've got to be believable okay and and interesting um you kind of make them three-dimensional uh and think about what the character wants because every character wants something yeah Okay, and that's the, as an actor, you should already focus that of, and through that the film. So if you had a fourteen-year-old boy playing video games, and 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 uh, that his want is to play video games, and if the father comes in and says, "Son, do your homework," the father's want is to get the, the you know the son to do his homework. So there's conflict there, you know, and it makes sort of, it makes the characters interesting how they're going to react. But if the father comes in and says, "Hey, son, play video games." The son goes, thanks very much. Story's over. The story's over. <laughs> so it's about finding those, those characters that might play off each other and make them three-dimensional. Uh, I say in the book, actually, there's a film called Terminator 2, mm. um, and there's a character in that called Sarah Connor, and she's kind of uh, really kind of three-dimensional because she's her really driven and focused to, to hunt down and kill the Terminator, and that's all she is. She's like quite, you know, sort of, she's just completely driven. There's nothing else that matters. But when she has the opportunity to kill the person that creates the computer that will then destroy the Terminators, she can't do it. She can't actually take a human life. So there's a three-dimensional. Yeah. She, she's like she's, she has her humanity as well as her drive, and it makes things interesting. Yeah. So, so you could maybe start off with like, um, in a way, stereotypical type. Type. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah. Um, stereotypical characters, and then yeah. add something and to them. And then add them. the yeah. Yeah, but for for secondary characters. Because you want to make your main characters really interesting, yeah. but for secondary characters or third characters, stereotypes are okay because obviously you can make them interesting, that's good. But if you need, sometimes you need a quick and fast way for the audience to go, here's the loud mouth taxi driver, here's the interfering mother in law. Yeah. Because we haven't got time or screen time to develop her anymore. Let's save that development for our hero leads. Yeah. So that's always, you know, you're forgiven if some of the characters are a little bit stereotypical because you need them to go, yes, I know who you are. The best you're, friend or, yeah, yeah. or whatever, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, that, yeah. that's great. Um, if, you've any, if you've got any questions, guys, make sure you let us know because um, I, can, I can make sure I, uh, I ask Paul any questions you've got. So do, do, do write them on the comments box. Um, so once you've got your characters and you'll start to put them in the scenes, um, how do you... How do you write the scene descriptions? Um, we were talking a bit earlier about how sometimes they could be like a novel and really sure. extensive. Yes. Um, and also you've got a really great um, tip about that as well. Yeah, so. well, I think <laughs> sometimes I get scripts sent to me where if the writer isn't very experienced, there's, there's something called embedded information, which is when the reader, there's information in those stage directions that the reader will get but the camera can't film it, and therefore the audience of the film won't understand that. Yeah. Um, and I think in my first book, I gave the example of, imagine this stage direction where it said, uh, a private detective, uh, uh, Johnson walks into his office, sits down at his desk, he opens an envelope and a bullet falls out. Johnson realizes that the bullet was sent by Smith because Johnson was having an affair with his wife. So Johnson gets his gun, checks the chamber, he knows where Smith's going to be and runs out. So that's the stage directions. But what does the camera see? The camera will see a guy walk in, sit at his desk, empty an envelope, a bullet falls out. He sits there for a bit longer, loads his gun and runs out. All the bit about who sent the bullet as the threat, the history with the guy's wife, where, how the character knows where the guy is, isn't on screen. Yeah. But when the director films that, 
and then watches that scene, he, the director and the writer will watch that and go, yeah, it's all there. The information's there because I, I know what he's doing because I wrote it. But the audience doesn't. They haven't got a clue. Have they, they haven't got no. a clue. Mm. And I think it's that information. And if it's important enough to be written in the stage directions, then it needs to come out in dialogue. Yeah. Or what we were talking about earlier about characters, the best way to, to have a character and display character is visually some, something physical. And it's a good tip for actors really as well, where any decision that the character makes or anything, actions that has to be visible, it has to be something physical because the camera needs to see it. Yeah. The camera needs to photograph that thought, that decision. Even so, if it's a small thought in the eyes? Absolutely. Or like, so yeah. if, it's, if, you, if, if, you're, if you, the character's got some dilemma and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna not do something or they're gonna decide to, to do something, perhaps it's a folding of the arms or perhaps they put the, the gun down or perhaps they hang up the phone. There's some kind of physical yeah. action. You can't just sit in your head and go, well, I'm thinking this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And it is the power of, the, of not, the, the thing, the not saying it, isn't it? Yeah. Because sometimes it's m more important in the, in the not saying of the words. Absolutely. So embedded information is something <laughs> that a lot of first time writers, they write it like a novel, the character thinks. I read something once where a character was looking through old photos or some photos and it said, Steve realises the girl in the photo is the one that he met at the party last year. And you go, OK, but what does the camera see? Steve looking at a photo. Yeah. And that's it. Now, if that's the opening scene of the movie and that information is important, then we need to go, how can we get that information across? And sometimes you end up then into bad kind of, you know, a bad way of getting information across where the character starts talking to themselves, where they go, oh, my God, it's Sarah from the party last year. And the character's talking out loud. So then you think, no, that's a bit crap. We need to find another way of doing that. Um, and it's just something to look out for if you're writing a script. How is that going to be photographed? Yeah. How is that going to come? When the An audience interesting way to show it rather yeah. than just, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, you say it could be a, a flashback or something like yeah, that rather absolutely. than the actor yeah. saying it. Yeah. So, yeah, embedded information, that is a really strong point. Um, a big no-no. Yes. <laughs> Um, so, how important do you think storyboards are, um, or, sh or like shot lists in advance of filming? I think shot lists, I personally, just my own experience, I prefer to do shot lists and I will storyboard anything that is being something big or expensive that another department needs to see. So if I'm just shooting two people in a room having coffee, I'll have a shot list where I say why close-up person A, close-up person B, close-up coffee cup or whatever it is. But if I'm doing a shot where, you know, the car streets around the corner, the alien ship blows up the building and the alien ship CG, the explosion's practical and the stunt man driving the car is going to come across this side of frame or whatever, I'll storyboard that. Yeah. Because then you can say each of the departments who are going to execute that need to go, okay, well, if the ship, the spaceship's there, I need the camera to be here and I need the information of what lens you're on and the explosion needs to be this side, a camera, etc. Rather than it just being, you know, building explodes by alien ship on the shot list. And what you need to communicate what you're seeing or yeah. what you want to see to the other departments. Um, a good tip with, with shot lists is to make them really brief. OK, so two people in a coffee shop, wide coffee shop medium person A, medium person B, close up person A, whatever, close up on keys, etc. Because when you're filming that, you want to be able to say on set, you want to be like, yeah, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. What you don't want is wide of coffee shop, Sarah walks in and sits down, orders a cappuccino, checks her phone, and then realizes that she's missed, had a missed call from her mum. Right. All that information is not required for the shop list. It's in the script. But when you're on set, and you're filming and the person says, or, you know, the AD or the camera person says, what's the next shot? You can go, okay, let me read. Just takes forever. Yeah, it's too, it takes too long. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, keep it really brief and then you just cross them off. So shot lists for me and storyboards for big stuff. So it'd be like Sarah walks in coffee shop wide. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's it. But obviously if you like drawing and you want to do, draw Sarah sat at the coffee shop, great. Yeah. But. If you, do, you don't need to do it necessarily. And it's about finding what works for you. If you don't want to, you know, I, what I wouldn't advise is not doing anything. Yeah. If you wing it, oh, I'll, I'll make it up on the day. I've done that and it doesn't work. That's because you're in the edit suite going, oh, I didn't get a close-up of Sarah's keys. Oh, because yeah. you kind of go, oh, we were in a rush, weren't we? Da, da, da. But if it's written down, it needs to be ticked off and it's something, you know, crossed off. So it needs, it's something. Is there sort of like an average of like how many 
shots in a scene? Yeah, well, not in a scene, but what you can do in a day. Right. So a good rule of thumb, if you're doing things properly from a point of view, if you're lighting the scene, you're blocking it and you're rearranging where it is and all the extras and the camera's moving, you're looking at about 25 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes per shot. Okay. So it's about three an hour. Okay. So yeah. if you've got two hours, that's about six shots. Right. Okay. So if you're on your shot list, you've got 15 shots and there's two hours left of the day you know you're, you either, not gonna, you're not going to do it or you need to start thinning your shots out or you're going to go over time. Yeah, yeah that's that, I, I just know from previous experience having um, acted on some sort of short films, um, you, you can definitely yeah, get to the point where there's just so, so much planned in them. Yeah. I don't think they know exactly no. where, how, yeah. how many they should be putting yeah. in. There's a saying in the industry, I think, where it's Hollywood in the morning, Hollyoaks in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, because everyone because goes, it's... oh, I do take 16 of the wide shot of Sarah walking in when you're going to be on that for about four seconds. And then by the time you get to the crying scene at the end, <laughs> you've got the lights going and you've got no time to do it. That's great. Yeah. That's a really good yeah. analogy. <laughs> um, just so that we've got some time for everyone to sort of comment in the box, um, I'd love you to, to sort of um, ask the viewers what the uh, question is for them to be able sure. to win this amazing book. Okay, so I think the question we're going to go, uh, what we're going to go with is, tell us why you think you would benefit from owning the book. How will yes. it help your current filmmaking practices? Yeah. How do you think it would benefit you? Tell us why. Um, yeah. And yeah, the real, Paul will pick his favourite answer and then you will get a copy of um, making your first blockbuster. And then we want to see the first blockbuster, potentially at the Horsham Film Festival. <laughs> Just bringing that one in. Um, <laughs> um, so actually talking about film festivals, what do you, what do you feel about them? Bit of a yeah, uh, curveball here, but um, no, yeah. Sure. I think, I think they're great because it's an opportunity, first of all, to network with other filmmakers and, and to see, also to see other work. You, you know, you don't know where you might sit on the ladder. So you might see some films that you go, wow, that's really good. I want to aspire to make that. Or how do they do that shot? I want to speak to the director or whatever. Or you might realise that some of the films aren't that strong and you go, hey, I'm better than I thought I was. Yeah. So there's a confidence thing there. You go, hey, do you know what? Are my films any good? We all have that self-doubt. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. am, am I any good? You know, uh, and to see other people's work. And you go, do you know what? I think I'm pretty average here. Actually, this is pretty good. I'm, I'm better than some, but not as good as the others. Um, but it's an opportunity to go, yeah, I know. Oh, I like that technique they did with the titles. I might copy that. Or, you yeah. know, how did they afford to do that? Or, I don't know. So it's an opportunity to network and learn from other things. Absolutely. I think it's a massive thing for networking. Yeah. Right? Sort of big, from running the festival um, with the guys, it's just... Yeah, it's a great place for people, great platform, yeah. really good place to see where you are in terms of sure. your own progression. And also seeing your work with an audience. Yes. You know, on the big screen and knowing, seeing how other people, you know, I don't know, to, you know, to see how other people take it and react to it, to hear strangers laugh or gasp. Yeah, you know great. you've done a good job. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> you're sat in the edit suite going, oh, I don't know if this is going to work, I don't know how it's going to play. And you show your mum, of course she laughs, you know, um, but you want to know what strangers think. Yeah. You know, someone that knows nothing about the film, did they get it, did they not get it? Um, and it's quite encouraging. You know, I, we were lucky enough with one of the projects that we did a couple of years ago where we were invited to go to Denver for a film festival over there, which was really nice. And we went over there and we had, we had a, the project had a lot of visual effects in it. I didn't do the work myself. My visual effects uh, supervisor, Alan Tabret, did the work. But we had a, a, one of the top VFX artists in LA was in the studio, in the off audience. And he came up to me afterwards and said, I don't know who did your effects, but they were fantastic. And I was like, well, thank you very much. I'll pass on the compliment. You know, so it's just a yeah. kind of a, you know, it was great for Al to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also good to know that other people recognize the work. You know, it's really exciting. Yeah, that yeah. sounds great. Yeah. yeah. Um, Actually, talking about special effects, I'm really interested in this as well because it just seems like such a big feat to overcome. Like if you have, if you're, if you're thinking of a film that has got that might need special effects, sure. um, you talk about that in this. Yeah, book. we've got a chapter yeah, yeah, on visual yeah. effects. Yeah. How yeah. do you? Um, I mean, what? What? Have you got any tips about that? Am I just yeah. <laughs> throwing in a question? Um, <laughs> well, the tips. Are, first of all, it's, what I love about visual effects are the shots that you, the audience, don't know are visual effects shots. Yeah. Okay, so you've got the alien spaceship blowing up or whatever. Yeah, everyone's going to go, yeah, special effects. But there's some shots where you're painting out a lamppost or you're reversing something, which is, you know, says you flop the shot and then you need to flop the sign in the background or something. Or, or you, I, you know, some of the shots we've done, we had a, I did a short film a couple of years ago where we had wonderful weather 
mm. for the whole day, apart from the last hour, where we had this blue sky with clouds. It was gorgeous. But for the evening, we had, it was all overcast and, and white, white oh. clouds. It was white sky. It was nothing. But it didn't match. So we went in and replaced the sky. And so it's just it's, it's, it. it's great because the audience doesn't know. Um, but the trick with visual effects is to make the shot look like it was filmed on the day. OK, so if there's a camera shake, or you know the camera zooms or the camera operator is trying to adjust or something is a bit out of focus or something you can put these it's about i say it in the book it's about taking the perfection out because it's quite easy to go well that's perfect i want that framed there and i want that there and it all looks too neat yeah but so sometimes if you make it a bit wobbly or you, you know the top of the alien's head is chopped off or you can't quite see all of that the audience kind of thinks oh that happened that was ah, real yeah. and, and you kind of sometimes we've actually done it where we've had some CG uh, computer graphics explosions or fire or something and I, we've got our graphics guy to purposely overexpose it and the fire isn't overexposed but almost less for a second yeah. because it was real the camera couldn't handle the extreme yeah. whites of the, of the fire and it went overexposed for a second before it came back That's like, really interesting, and yeah. you just you build in these fake issues that make it look real trick like small tricks that make it because i suppose if you were doing like a you know like on some films where it's like a handheld when it's is someone filming it in the yeah, film yeah. like you can get but i didn't realize that you'd also do that even if it was just a yeah. normal shot like yeah, yeah it's so clever yeah it's a great fun i love reverse engineering the shots as well and going okay so I, what i want is we had something for a show we did uh, called horizon a couple of years ago where we had a scene set in 1885 and there's, in Bristol, we have a suspension bridge, the Bristol Suspension Bridge. And we wanted a character looking out of the window to see the bridge being built. And the shot lasted four seconds. So we filmed in the window, uh, looking out. Um, we filmed uh, our character against green screen. Then we filmed the window. Yeah. Which, but you could see outside the window just being, I think it was like Burger King across the road or whatever. Then we went and took some still images of the bridge itself. And our graphics guy, Al, went in and changed the bridge and put some CG scaffolding on it. And that became the background. Wow. Then they put the window over the top of that and cut out each of the window panes. And replaced, so the window frame is then over the, the suspension bridge shot. Then we have the shot of our actor, which we're filming over his shoulder against green screen, key out the green and stick him over the top of that. And then to make it real, Al went in and where we'd cut out the window holes, obviously there's nothing there, it's glass, but he put in smudgy bits of, or, yeah, just kind yeah. of like a dirty window. So you're looking through a dirty window at the suspension bridge being built. Wow. But you just reverse engineer what you want to see, yeah. break down each of the layers. We need a still image of the suspension bridge. We need the shot of the window. We need the green screen of the actor shoot each of those it's like a problem solving together. exercise yeah and it's fantastic and do you really enjoy that yeah i love it yeah. yeah to me that sounds like <laughs> i didn't have a clue no, it's great fun <laughs> um so we've got a question in okay i'm um, not being rude um so graham carr uh would like to know working on my very first sci-fi feature film uh, on a minuscule budget i believe your book would be an amazing resource for building my knowledge around visual effects creation and creating action it's not really a question, it's just sort of comment. Uh, is, that, no, is, that, is that his <laughs> oh, is that, uh, carry submission on? for the prize? For the oh, prize. sorry, yeah, well, there we go. Question as well. Oh, okay, sorry, 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 we preempted that, but look, remember that. That sure. was a really good, um, that was a really okay, good comment, great. Graham. Thank you, Graham. Um, the question <laughs> uh, was, would you like to ask, I would like to ask Paul, uh, about your experience uh, with distribution of his films and any tips for working with a distributor sales agent? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, distribution is a funny thing because um, uh, it's about numbers, it's about you know, what, what value you have of the film, what the market's about, um, and there's a lot of shady distribution companies out there where you might sign your film over to them and the money doesn't come through, mm. or they say, oh, we're going to spend X amount of money on prints and advertising and getting your film out there, so when the profits come in, they've tweaked those numbers so the profits don't actually come back to you. Yeah. But thinking about it you know make sure you get lots of still images lots of behind the scenes stuff and and thinking about the story so I've had an experience recently where thinking about your audience so if you've got a horror film the distributor is going to want to know that there's some horror or some blood or something in that film and if you've got like a quite a slow burning spooky type thing and the horror comes at the end the distributor 
sometimes, and I've heard this sometimes, the distributors will sit in a room and watch the first 10 minutes and mm. say, yes, we'll buy it. No, we won't buy it. So if your horror is at the end, they've missed that and they go, well, I'm, buying, I'm not going to buy this. There's no horror in it because they're not going to watch the whole film. So then, unfortunately, you're then tweaking your own film to go, well, let's put some blood at the beginning, even though it doesn't fit the story, just to tick the box of the distributor. And then they're probably going to change the poster, you know, and, and they, they kind of want to make it what they know sells. Yeah, but sometimes you have to just sort of accept that in a way, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it is. It's a bit, of a, if it, it's a bit of an awkward thing. But I would also recommend making your film, get it polished, and then send it to someone as a distributor and say, hey, are you interested in this? When well, you send it to a distributor, do you, send, you, don't send like a, you don't send like a teaser of what it is? No, you want watch... you'd send the whole film because right, they want okay. to know what, what the, the, whole, the whole movie is about. Yeah. But rather than get someone on board who's then interfering with the the production of the movie or you might end up with something that's really quite special and it might sell to a quite a big well-known distributor but you've already signed a deal with the small one of the company around the corner you know two guys working out of their flat who set up their business yesterday and therefore you can't then uncuff yourself from that deal yeah. then so it's a tricky business yeah it's a bit of um yeah moving things around like moving parts isn't it yeah Sounds, well that was a great question though graham like Thank you, really Graham. great question um, and we will definitely consider your comment there. That's great. Um, good luck on your first feature. Um, amazing. Thank you. Um, so we were talking about, we mentioned mums earlier. I don't know what we were talking about, but um, there's a really great comment in the um, book about, well, uh, about the mum factor yeah. um, and about what that means, okay. um, which I think is really helpful. Um, so hopefully everyone else will, but yeah, okay. I'd love to know a bit more about that. Okay. One. Well, the mum factor uh, is basically my mum, if she was, uh, she, basically my mum represents the audience and all she cares about is what's the story and is she engaged? So she doesn't care about kit, she doesn't care that you shot up 4K, she doesn't care what you cut it on, she doesn't care about your shot, which is a homage to that, you know, 50s movie, in, you know, French, whatever. <laughs> it, she, doesn't, she doesn't care. Um, and I think sometimes it, we can get hung up as filmmakers on that. Mm. And also we can get hung up on, uh, you know, like I was working with a DP a couple of years ago where the light coming in the room, uh, realistically, the light wouldn't hit the actor's face where they were positioned. And I said, well, actually, you know what, let's cheat the, you know, the lights come through the window behind them, but we could cheat the light source around a little bit so it catches their face. And it makes the actor look good. And the DP was like, well, that's not what's happening. The light, that's not realistic. The light is coming from this side. And it's like, well, look, you're talking degrees here. You could cheat the light round so it hits the actor's face because it's very flat otherwise. And I th that's a mum factor. My mum wouldn't care. Yeah. She's not going to know. She's going to go, well, there's light in the room. As long as the light's kind of colour-wise, it's consistent. It's not like you're adding this red light on her face or his face. And it's like, well, where's that coming from? Um, but as long as the actor looks good, it doesn't matter and you can do you know we get student filmmakers get hung up on crossing the line and all this kind of stuff and all these technical things but you go is the story good you know mum, my mum has never watched a film and said i you know i hated it it was really boring but at least the lighting was correct and geographically to the location that they filmed it in yeah. and they shot on ari primes she's never said that to me <laughs> i would be very surprised if she did um, she might now that yeah. she's like listening to it. Yeah, but well, well, Paul, they were on Zoom lenses, not primes. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So the light in the room, you know, all that matters is, is it engaging? Is it, am I, is it a good story? Um, yeah, because yeah. I, I guess you need to remember who your audience is. It's not going to be yeah. like a room full of people that are really technical. No, and also, even if it is, it's, it doesn't matter. It's about, and it's, it's getting hung up like that or worrying about the light. You're... You're, you're, you're avoiding the opportunity or you're missing the opportunity to create some really interesting images and really something and and you know it's just not all about aesthetics necessarily but if your actor looks good the audience enjoys what they're watching they're not necessarily going to say well hang on a minute mm. that light isn't right I mean I'm a, a big fan of the director Ridley Scott mm. and he's a really good advocate of this where he would when he filmed his first movie called The Duelist it was about two guys dueling back in like 1700 in France and and he had a son literally the son there were two guys dueling and the son was behind the shoulder of this actor over here and this actor over here so oh you right two so sons. yeah you'd be like what <laughs> yeah but and he said I don't care it's good yeah 
Amazing. Yeah. So you just have some artistic license as well. Yeah, right? and there's a lot more artistic license than you think you've, you've got a lot access to a lot more than you think you have. Because yeah. mum doesn't care. And that's what mum doesn't mind that there's two sons, does no. she? No. <laughs> She'd be like, oh, she's on Tatooine or something. I don't know. Have you got another question, Paul? Um, is it another question or is it a comment? Well, ask a question, then there's a question. There's a question and a comment. Okay. Um, sorry, just bear with me. Sure, sure. sure. Yes. So, hi, Paul. Um, with students heading back to a variety of film courses, what would be your one tip for all students to consider before they start shooting their films? P.S. I hope it's not M.O.S. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Who's, who, who asked the question? Richard Sims. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, Rich happens to be a very good sound recordist that I know, so thanks, Rich. Oh, hi, Rich. Oh, he's brilliant. <laughs> he's actually gold. Um, the tip I would say is keep the film as simple as possible. Uh, the amount of film, student films that I see where they're so big, the ambition, I'm not going to rain on ambition because ambition is great but the ambition is so big, you are forcing the audience to make concessions immediately. I've seen scripts, six minute scripts, of a uh, futuristic, dystopian world where you know it's all post-apocalyptic, and it's like, well, you can't execute that. But they have their actors walking around in a leather coat with some kind of red tattoo on their forehead, some kind of Matrix style, and it's like, you're immediately going, okay, so I can see you're filming in your grand's front room, it doesn't quite work. OK, what, what are you doing? But if you could say, OK, I've got a story here about these two people that, you know, meet in the coffee shop or, you know, whatever it might be, then you can execute that to a good quality standard that people are going to be impressed with without trying to emulate big yeah. films. And I've done it. I've fallen on my face so many times where I've gone, hey, let's do this car chase. Let's do this. Let's do that. And it doesn't work. And, you know, your dad goes, or my mum, well done. Yeah. You tried. You tried. <laughs> but, you know, in your head, you think it's something big. And there's no harm in that. You, it's great. Get out of your system, maybe. But if you want to be a serious filmmaker, yeah, do something that is within your realms of execution. Yeah. And make sure the story and the acting's top notch rather than going, OK, we can't do the futuristic world, so don't even attempt yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I watched a really beautiful short film what, ages ago. I can't remember who did it, but it was called, um, it was um, about two beach comas that just fell in love and there was no words Brilliant. it was so short I think it won some, a BAFTA yeah. um, and they were just across the, a bridge and like waving at each other and they fell in love over like over Absolutely. a bridge and it was such a beautiful film yeah. it was so simple yeah. Um, yeah so yeah I guess it's sort of making sure that you you make it simple but executed well yeah mm. absolutely and it's you know, we've all done it, but yeah, make sure that you don't overreach yourself. Yeah. 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 And then when you've got the money and the team behind Absolutely. you, you can do the big car Absolutely. chases. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Was it was there something that you really wanted to do at the beginning, and you've now managed to be able to like shoot that thing that you wanted to do? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm trying to think. I've done a few things where it hasn't quite worked. You know, I've done. I've tried to do. You know, I've done the explosion stuff and blowing up that and you know running away from this and gunfights and stuff like that and you kind of mess it up I, you know yeah. I haven't shot it right and it's wasted money but then you know that's how you learn that's how you learn how to do it um, but yeah. I have seen the opposite I have seen filmmakers have access to money and do the big stuff and they haven't mastered the simple stuff yes that's interesting they just and, focus on that yeah and if you think I have something in the earlier book actually um, a, a section in the first book shooting better movies and the title is basically limiting the variables and limiting the variables is about making sure that you're not from a not from not overreaching thing but all of those things like special effects and stunts and all that stuff are all variables yeah. so if you have uh, a, the camera you're using if it's an unknown camera that's a variable. The weather is a variable. Your child actor is a variable. And all of them have the possibility to upset your shoot. So if you can limit those. Yeah. So, and I've seen it with a filmmaker I knew who did a two-hander in a coffee shop, great, which is a short film. And he was telling me about his feature film. And the feature film, so immediately we've gone from 10 minutes to 90, which is a futuristic sci-fi thing, okay, with two kid actors. Wow. And he wants to shoot it on this new 4K camera that was coming out. So the variables there are a feature film that he's never shot, sci-fi elements, so then you're into visual effects that he's never done, kid actors, which are, means chaperones and limited hours, um, and a new camera that you've never used. So you might be halfway through the shoot, and you've got 10 minutes to go because your child actor needs to go because of the legal hours. 
and you've got a big visual effects number to do and your camera's broken down yeah. because you don't know how the menu works. So a variable in that would be, let's use a camera we know. If we're going to go from short to feature, let's not do the sci-fi thing. Or if we're going to do the sci-fi thing, don't have child actors. So you just limit all those variables. And yeah. that's what I've learned over time because they will all trip you up. And even if you master all of them, it'll be raining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always raining. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's about making sure that you juggle those. And I think we've all yeah. done it, but it's about Good limiting tip. those, yeah. Very good tip. Yeah. Um, and I think in your, uh, I read something where you, I don't know if it's the, it, which book it is, but you talk about um, like n not having excuses. Like oh, it's the yeah, biggest yeah. thing. Yeah. And I just, that just really rang true to me yeah. because like, so many times I've gone, no, I just don't have the time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. What was so good was that you said, just take half an hour, get it half an hour early or yeah, half yeah. an hour later. And then yeah. you've got seven hours. Yeah, on a week. Yeah. yeah. That no, that's the biggest thing, time. And yeah. if you want to do something, we will make the time. Exactly. But if you don't want to do it, oh yeah but this thing happened no 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 you don't understand I've got this and it's like well, you're scared of doing it yeah but, but do you know what I see it I mean I see it on Facebook where I'll be talking to I'll be talking to an actor friend of mine or a, a parent or, or somebody else and it'll say oh my god I haven't got time to do any of this and then the next day they go oh I've just blitzed Game of Thrones season 8 it was awesome and it's like but you told me you didn't have time to write your script but you've just found 10 hours to watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> and it's like, it's all priorities, isn't it? It is all priorities, yeah. It's all yeah. priorities, yeah. yeah. It's the hardest thing, I think. Yeah. Um, I've got another... Um, oh, sorry, yeah, we do actually need some more questions. So please do, um, do let us know. Um, and some comments in the box below, because you could win this fabulous book. So do make sure you tell us why. Um, yeah, what was your question, Paul, was just yeah, to make why, sure... Tell us why you want it, or why it would benefit you. Why would yeah. it benefit you? Because it's a, it is um, it is sold out at the moment, so you can't get it anywhere other than here. Well, you, you might be able to, but at one place I looked, you can't. <laughs> um, and don't sell it on eBay once you've got it. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Um, amazing. Yeah, that's so so many good tips. I've learned so much already. Um, so yeah, do let us know your questions, please, guys. Um, we have yeah, we've got quite a lot of. Did I ask this one about the about new t new filmmakers? Because we've got quite a lot of. It sort okay. of links into. Um, Richard's question. Okay. Um, but we have, especially with the film festival that we run as well, we've got quite a lot of first time filmmakers um, and so, and they haven't done it before. Sure. So I don't know if you've got any like really good tips. Uh, yeah, sure. Filmmakers. Okay. Well, I would say keep it really simple. And an idea that I was talking to, I was doing a lecture the other week where this idea just formed where I said, let's just say your, let's just say your parents own a, a flower shop. Okay and it's closed on Sundays. And you go, ah, I've got an access to a flower shop. What, can I, what story could I do in there? Okay, and the idea was we could have, you could have a girl that works in the flower shop and every day a guy comes in and buys flowers, brilliant. And he comes in, he keeps buying, coming in to buy flowers and it's just a short film, they have a little conversation or something. And in the last scene, he comes in, buys the flowers and then hands them back over to her. And he's been coming in every day. Oh, I gave you goosebumps. To see, to see this girl. But from a photography point of view, You've got all this colour, okay? You could do it over two months where the weather's changing. You could change costumes. You could, it's two actors. You're indoors, so you haven't got to worry about weather. Mm -hmm. It's really simple. It's something that you've got access to because if your parents didn't own a flower shop and you had to then approach a flower shop, you're then saying, hey, you don't know me, but can I come into your place of business on a Sunday and shoot? And how much are you going to charge? And how much are they going to charge? So, you know, if they own a particular business or they own a, a, a you know, rank of taxis or something, I don't know, anything. Try and make a, 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 something around that because that's good value, it's good production value. You've got a shop, you've got all the colour. I mean, yeah. if, from a photographer point of view, like I say, you've got all these saturation colours going on. Perhaps it's raining one day. Um, you know, how is it going to be over the course of a week? Is it over the course of a year? You know, mm. any kind of how can we creatively make things work? So my tip would be, yeah, keep it really, really simple. Okay, and then it becomes dialogue. Then it becomes performances. Yeah, you know, my mum would love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah your mum loves your mom it, love so it. it's going to be right. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really great tip. Yeah, um, I think, and obviously, as, as you're a cinematographer as well, it's sort of like you think about all these things. I mean, yeah. Or do you think every everyone, any filmmaker, should think about the color and the sure. not just you know, not just the story. Yeah, what yeah, it looks like. yeah. But, uh, but visually, yeah, production value. You want it to jump off the screen and go, hey, that looks great. Oh my god, how did you manage to film that? And you go, well, my dad owns it. Mm. Or I borrowed it off my uncle or something. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Great idea. Um, directing can be physically and mentally demand a, a mentally demanding job with irregular hours. Uh, what is your top tip for looking after your own well-being while in production? 
Okay, who said that? That is also from Graham. Okay. Um, yeah, I would say it's a really, really important thing to take good care of your health. Yeah. And that's before, in a, and in a general way anyway, you know, you don't want to just go, well, I, you know, I eat burgers and chips and I don't exercise throughout the whole year, but during the two weeks I'm shooting, I'll start running or something. It doesn't work that way. So looking after yourself. And I think even just from a point of view of like the preparation that you're doing, if you've done your preparation, you're not going to be so stressed. You're not going to necessarily, you know, you will have problems sleeping at night before the shoot, I'm sure. But it's, you're not up at night worrying about something because you've done the prep. So it's about getting the right sleep. It's about taking the right, getting the right foods, drinking water, all the basic stuff. And your body's going to need a lot of energy to kind of keep yourself ticking over. And sometimes, and we've all done it, where you make the mistake of not eating and, and, and it's just not good. You crash by the, you know, yeah. the end of the, the week because you haven't taken care of your body. So you know, even if it just means getting up a half hour earlier and having a really nice breakfast, a really healthy breakfast that fills you up, gets you ready for the day, whatever you need to, to, to make sure that you're not running around flustered and you, that you carry that onto the set then. So yeah. it's about looking after yourself and also before the, before the shoot. You know, so you're getting your nine hours or whatever you need in the couple of months leading up to it. You're fit, you're healthy, you're drinking lots of water because you don't want to then crash in week four of the shoot or whatever you're doing because you're going to be no good to anyone or you come down with a cold mm. or something. So it's all about being, you know, practical. It will affect being... how you are on set, right? Pardon? It will affect how you are oh, on absolutely. set. Oh, absolutely. And you don't want to be, end up being grouchy, snapping at the actors because you haven't slept the night before. The you haven't slept the night before is because you were worried about that thing or you were chasing that thing you haven't organized yet because you haven't done your preparation. So think about the knock-on effect. It's like throwing a stone into the water, it just ripples out. Yeah, so absolutely. So everything's connected to everything else. Do you think, um, obviously when you're starting out as a filmmaker, um, maybe you're not getting paid as much <laughs> money to sort of do the job, so you have to work alongside other yes, things. Yes, yes. Um, I don't know if you've got any tips, because um, you know, as Graham said, it's sort of, a demanding job and it, yep. it can be difficult I guess to get regular work yeah um yeah. I don't know if you've got any tips around like that around sort of how what? to how to go about um like working your way through passion projects and doing what you want but also like getting money in and and I don't know I, I find that hard as an actor really to balance my life like yeah. that so I don't know if you've if, I you've think it's one of those things first of all I think is any type of filmmaker that you are I mean I have this actually I think in the first book where yeah, if you, if you need to work for free on projects, obviously if you're doing it your own project, you're gonna be working for free and you just have to make it work. And if yeah. you're grafting, if you're doing your regular job nine to five, you have your dinner, a couple of hours with the kids or whatever, and then you do eight till 12 on your own film and then at the weekends. And, and I think working with other filmmakers that have done that and filmmakers that wanna be filmmakers that haven't done their film yet, that's the difference. Yeah. And it's like, they haven't finished that script yet. And it's like, well, you know, you have just done all of Game of Thrones, you could have done your script if you wanted to, and then they're still tweaking that, or they're waiting for the money to come in, or they're applying for that grant that they might get in 2024, in which case your passion for the film has died. Yeah. So if you, if you need to get a bank loan, if you need to work double hours at Tesco's, if you need to do whatever, that's the way, you yeah. know, you do it. Uh, and that's the way I did it. You know, if you look at filmmakers in America like Kevin Smith, who made Clerks and stuff, you're maxing out credit cards, you're working throughout the night, and you have to, you have to, that's the part of the, the sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. And it's the same for actors as well. Absolutely, it's the same yeah. For it's actors. It's, yeah. And it's again what we were talking about, like they're not making excuses, yeah, and just yeah. doing it. And I think it. it's funny, I always look at the first reactions. Philosophy, other people's philosophy will come at you with their immediate reactions. So if I said to a crew member or I said to a student, hey, do you want to come on a shoot? We're filming and it, we're, the, we're, we're on top of that hill in January at 6 a.m. And if they go, hey, sounds cool. Where do I park? You know, whatever, count me in. Or if they go, 6 a.m., uh, I don't know. And it's like that initial reaction tells me everything. Yeah. You know, it's the philosophy. It's like, oh, I'll have, to, I'll have to get time off work, but leave it with me. I can make it work. And it's like it tells me they're passionate. But if you drop any, any excuse in before that thing that you want to do, that should be telling you something. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. And it's, yeah, it is all just about sort of, you know, making sure that you, if you've got, if you've got that passion, then do, do something about it. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, amazing. So um, 
a sort of linking, I guess. Budget's always a big part of filmmaking. So um, how should you be aware of what things might cost when writing scripts? And uh, again, a bit about, maybe a bit about, about the distribution question was you know, sort of how do you get it made? Um, okay, well, I think there's, there's two things. <laughs> if you're writing a script just to practice your craft of screenwriting, you can write about whatever. Interplanetary alien battles, you know, you know, hordes of the undead coming out of the ground, whatever, write your script, great. But if you're writing something with a view to making it, you have to have one eye on the budget, one eye on production going, yeah, but how can we do that? Um, which is where keeping it simple comes in yeah. and, and, and kind of going, what can we do? Um, you know, I've read scripts before where, like I said, you know, there's kind of like a post-apocalyptic thing and there's a 50-foot wall around a city and they, someone send it to me and they go, I want to make this film. And I'm like, immediately, I don't know how you... How are you doing that? You, you're either building a 50-foot wall or you're doing it in CG. How's, how are you going to execute that? Mm. Um, and I always remember uh, I had a script once for one of my students a long time ago, and it was a short film that he wanted to make. And the opening lines were, the four police cars come to a screeching halt outside the burning house. And right. I smiled. <laughs> and I was like, OK. And I said, how are you going to do this? And he goes, well, I'll get the police cars. And they come to a stop. And the house is on fire. And I'm like, yeah, but how are you going to do that? And if you break that down, you go, OK, so we need to, you know, unless you're dabs with the policeman, who can get you four police cars. But you're talking then, cordon off a road, getting the police. You're, you're looking at stunt coordinators, trying to coordinate the cars coming to a screeching halt so no one gets injured. How are you going to do the burning house? I said, how are you going to do the fire? And he goes, oh, it doesn't have to be fire. It could just be smoke. And I'm like, OK, say you put a smoke bomb in the window of the house you're filming at. What does Mrs. Jones at number 63 think when she looks across the street and she sees smoke coming out of that house? She's going to think the house is on fire. So what's she going to do? She's going to call the fire brigade. Yeah. So then you're into letting the police and fire brigade know that you're filming, that don't be alarmed. Oh, sorry. Yeah, not in the film, Mrs. Not, Jones. Yeah. It's in actual Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones at number 63 yeah. is going to go, oh, there's yeah, a fire yeah. over there. Because she might be able to see the camera crew. You'd have to go around to every house with a letter to so say that you So they've got to go around to every house. So, and that's before the action. No one's opened their mouth yet. So it's about what are you, how are you going to execute that? How are you going to do it? And we all fall into that trap. I did something in the show a couple of years ago where I wrote the script where it said the group, they break into a museum and they break the display cabinet with a baseball bat. That's one line of text. There we are, I sat in my bedroom writing that, gold, right? How are you gonna do that? So when you break it down, this is what happened, right? We're filming in this museum in Bristol. I'd have to put a call into a special effects company down in Devon and say, I want some sugar glass, because that's how they make glass, which can break. This is the dimensions of the display cabinet, okay? And they say, okay, it's gonna cost you X amount of money. Now, do you buy one or do you buy two? Yeah, what if something goes wrong? Because if one breaks, you've got nothing left. So then you're into budget constraints. So then we go down, and the guy on the phone, the special effects guy, he said, so then I've got a range of time to go down and collect it. He said, it's in a, it's in a wooden carton. We've nailed it together. It's all this, you know, kind of polystyrene to protect it. And he said, you need a van to pick it up, because if you put it in your car and you go over a speed bump or you brake harsh, you're gonna, it's going to break. So you need a van strapped down in the back of this van for this carton with this glass in it. OK, OK, so we get the van, we go down and pick up this case. But we're picking it up on a Friday. And the location that we're filming in, we're not filming until the following Monday. So then are we having the van over the weekend, which obviously adds to the higher cost, or are we hiring the van once, dropping it back, then hiring the van again on the Monday to put the case in the back, strap it down? Then we jump to the location. So then we're at the location. How we put, and we've got sheets of glass. How is that coming together? It's not a display cabinet just yet. So then you have to make a call to an art director to see if he's available, she's available, to come along with special glue to put the thing together. And then it got to get put into the, in the location, then you've got to film it, then you've got to smash it, then you've got to clear away the rubbish. All because some writer went, they smashed the display case with a, <laughs> with a baseball bat. But the cost and the logistical things involved behind that one thing was massive. And like, how important is that to the script? There you go. So you have to ask yourself, how important is that thing? Is the burning house? Is the four police cars? And I've got a thing in the book, actually, about breaking down visual effects, where if there's a scene in the uh, a, if stage directions might say, Santa Claus flies down into the town square, and a load of kids run up and pet the reindeer. That's the stage direction. And if you break that down, what have you got? You've got 
CG flying. Loads of kids. Look, you've got loads of kids. <laughs> we need to be chaperoned and looked after. You need to cordon off the town square. You need to put fake snow down. You've got CG smoke. You've got a snow. You've got practical snow. You've got a CG Santa flying in. You've got a real Santa and a reindeer on location. Where are you getting the Santa from? You can probably ask the big guy, see if he wants to come down and do a guest part in your movie. Where are you getting the reindeer from? Where are you keeping the reindeer when they're not on set? Who's clearing up after the reindeer? Who's feeding them? Where are you keeping the kids when you're not filming? Because it's at night, they're going to get cold. You've got a local shop you can put them in. It's massive. So then the scene gets stripped right back and it ends up being two adults talking during the day going, I think it might snow later, let's go tell the kids. Because you've got no kids involved, you've got no snow, you've got no Santa. Exactly, yeah. But that, that then if you're making a Christmas movie, you need those elements. But you that's more likely going to get it made, right? Sorry? That, that, back, going back to the question, that's more likely going to get it made. That's more likely going to get it made. But it's just one of the things like what can be shot for the budget you're working on. Yeah, absolutely. And even the smallest thing, like my example with the, the display case, even the smallest thing yeah. of fire, night scenes, you know, a lot of students film scripts I read where there are people are running through the woods at night. Yeah. And you go, practically, how are you lighting that? Because I've done it where you've set up during the day, you wait for it to, lo to get night, you turn your lights on, everything looks good. Once you've turned off your film lights, it's pitch black in the middle of a wood. So how are you then getting your crew and cast out of the woods safely? I've but done that in a part of a horror film and I've had to go and I'm literally standing in the middle of the yeah. woods petrified going, is any, can anyone, is anyone there? So then you're, in, then you're looking at practical lights, yeah. like as in battery operated practical lights to help light the path to get you back to the cars. All because your scene says, you know, the people walk through the woods at night. Yeah, wow. So it's massive, you have to think, it is really how am I going to shoot that? Got to have like a producer's head on, yeah, all writing the, time. the script. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Which is why a good short film is two people in a flower shop. You know, it's character, it's, it's, it's heart, it's, it's not big effects, it's not, yeah. you know. Yeah. Perhaps the flower shop blows up at the end of the day. Because <laughs> yeah, the aliens come down. Right yeah, yeah. Um, if you guys have got any questions, please, please, please do let us know. Um, and if you'd like to win this book, you can make a comment um, in the box and Paul would like to know what how you could how, how you're going to benefit from that how you can benefit from it yeah. uh, from getting this book because um, it is sold out so um, in some places um, so it's very hard to get hold of you want it I'm, there's so many good things in it um, there's, I mean there's literally so much to talk about um, so next question I have for you is um, yeah, about kit, actually, because I'm sure a lot okay. of our viewers would like to know about that. Um, I think a lot of people get hung up on it. Yeah. Um, and we've definitely spoke to, to people about the fact that it's not really about the quality of the kit, essentially. No. Um, so we'd love to know what you think about, about that, really. Sure. I think it's just one of those things where, obviously, cameras now, there's so many of them coming out. The resolutions are going up overnight. You know what I mean? Um, but it's just not getting hung up on that. I mean... You know, you could shoot something, you could give the best camera kit in the world to a sort of an amateur filmmaker and you could give an iPhone to the best cameraman in the world. And I tell you, the camera person over here with the iPhone is going to shoot something better. Mm. And it's all about how you film something. It's about the depth, it's about the camera angle, it's about the story and all the rest of it. Again, mum factor. My mum's not going to look at the movie and go, hey, I see you use the Blackmagic 6K on that, you know, with Ari Primes. She's not going to say that. But, I mean, I, even down to uh, some filmmakers are like, oh, I'm always using prime lenses. I like these vintage lenses. And all that. That's all great. But, you know, I personally prefer zoom lenses because I'm, they're a bit more quick and practical. I can grab a couple of shots off one, you know, sort of setup rather than having to stick with one lens. And it's speed for me. And it, oh, back in the day, the, the quality difference between a prime lens, which is a single focus lens, and uh, a zoom lens, used to, you could notice because the zoom is a little bit grainier, the, the quality wasn't there. But after three or four seconds, my mum's watching that. She's going to go, OK, this is the quality of the lens. This is the quality of the image, sorry, that I'm looking at. What's the story? She's not going to go, oh, Master Primes, great, vintage there, lenses. Yeah. yeah, she's not going to care. But sometimes it's easy to get hung up on this. And I have filmmakers approach me sometimes going, I've got a new film, I'm going to make it, and we're shooting on the red. Mm. Like I'm going to be, oh, wow, like that's important. It's not important. It's what's the story. 
Yeah. Um, the only time, obviously, like if camera kit is important, obviously, because if you're doing big visual effects things and you need a, you're going to be zooming in and, and, and if you're doing some shots which are the, you're adding camera shake or something, you need a big uh, sensor, so you need a big resolution to, in order to have the opportunity to do that without the quality dropping. Or if you're filming something for Netflix, Netflix require 4K, yeah. you can't shoot something on HD or 3800 or whatever, it has to be 4K. So therefore, you're looking at these cameras over here that can shoot that. Um, but that's about it. Once off, you know, once you've got the camera, it then becomes story, and where you put in the camera. Um, and I, shot, I, I, I to explain this example, I remember being at a film festival actually, and I saw a short film which had the production value of like James Bond. It was shot on the Alexa. The costumes were amazing. The grade, the music, the effects, everything was awesome. And guess what everyone said when they came out? Didn't know what it was about. Didn't know what it was about, <laughs> and I was so bored. Really? Yeah. Yes. And it, was, it became the talk of the festival because it, everyone knew it was amazing, like to look at, made by people that knew what they were doing. But what was the story? And we were bored. And there was other films there that were shot on iPhones, the 5D, C300s, made with no kit or whatever. But the story was amazing. It was engaging. It was engrossing. Yeah. Mum would have loved it. Yeah. But everyone else was bored by this high production value shot on these amazing cameras. It doesn't matter. So don't get hung up on the kit. Yeah, yeah, that's so think that's story, such a good story, idea. Story. So I think that, that actually stops people from doing things sometimes. It does, Because they yeah. get worried. They're like, oh, I don't have this latest thing yeah. or whatever. But yeah. It, yeah. It doesn't matter. Well, and it wasn't Birdman filmed on like, or was that just because it was a continuous shot? It might have just because it yeah, continued sure continu continu There was, there was shot. a film, that, a really big film that was, yeah. I can't remember it, but it was filmed on an iPhone. Yeah. So, yeah, you should definitely make films. <laughs> don't worry about the kit. Um, so... Yeah, well, what, do you, uh, what advice do you have for directors about putting a scene together for filming and the basic language of creating a coherent s uh, scene on screen? I th okay, I would say uh, about mastering the fundamentals, the basics of coverage. I mean, we talked about two people in the coffee shop or whatever, knowing what shots to get just to capture the actors. Yeah. I need that shot. I need the close-up of the phone. I need the close-up of the, the coffee or whatever it is and grab that rather than trying to um, jump too far ahead and, and create all these ambitious shots that end up not being able to cut together. And I think having an understanding of editing is the key. So if you want to be a really good director, know editing, know how to edit something together, know how one shot's going to cut to the next and how that shot's going to cut to that and how that shot, you know, cut, you're on this particular shot here. I, can, I know in my head I can cut to that shot. I can cut back to the wide. I can cut to that medium. I reckon I'm going to cut to the medium, but in the edit suite, I've got these other options. And I know how it's going to cut, rather than going, well, I've just shot these things, let the editor deal with it. And then you get to the edit suite and you go, oh, I realise it doesn't work. And understanding geography about where people are in the room. Yeah. And that sometimes, just because you're there as the director, I call it like the jigsaw puzzle, where say we had a scenario where the hero, the hero cop is hiding behind the sofa, okay, and the bad guys are at the door, and they're, gonna, they're trying to you know, fire away, and they're trying to shoot each other. And we've got some innocent civilians, or my mum, <laughs> bless her, <laughs> she's over in the corner <laughs> carrying, right? And she's all scared. And the gun for the cop is over there, right? So geography-wise, the audience needs to know that the villains are there, 15 feet away from our hero, to the hero's right is my mum, Karen, in the corner, bless her, and the gun, which he dropped, is over there. Yeah. How's he going to do that? How's that going to be shot? You can't just go close up villains, close up mum, close up hero cop, give it to the editor. Because what happens is the director who's on the set during the day knows where everyone was. And when he or she watches the footage, he sees that. Yeah. So he or she has got, say they've got 50% um, of the, the, 50, the footage represents 50% of the story. The director's mind, because he was there on the day, represents the other 50%. So when the director or the camera operator watches the finished scene, they go, hey, that makes sense. When my mum watches the film, she just gets the 50% of the footage because that's the only part of the jigsaw puzzle that she's been offered. She wasn't there on the day and she doesn't know that the villains are over there and they're 15 feet between them. She just goes, well, we went from close up to close up. It's all a bit confusing. And there's an example I give when I teach sometimes. There used to be an old police show called Police Squad. Yeah. Back in the 70s, I think. And there was a really good joke in that where you had a close-up of the Leslie Nielsen, who was the cop, 
firing behind this park bench. Then it'd be a close-up of the robber firing back at him. And then it cut to the wide shot, and you realise they're two feet apart. And they're firing at each other like that. And that's where the joke is. Because they've intentionally uh, yes. not shown the wide, which gives us the geography. Yeah. If amazing. you had the wide shot first, you would go, okay, why are they firing? So that doesn't make sense. But they know the audience is going to go, oh, they're firing, I don't know, 15, 20 feet apart across the park. But actually, they're that far yeah. apart. But that's geography. And a good director needs to know that the geography is being transmitted onto the screen. Yeah, so it's, it is very popular. It's like, yeah, like, a jigsaw, like you said, a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yes, we've got a question. Sorry, Paul. Um, where, again, Graham, lovely. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, when you're planning your day's shooting schedule, how do you work out how much time you will allocate to each scene? We'd, we had spoke a little bit about that earlier. I think about how much you really yeah. averagely do. But. Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, 20 to 25 minutes per shot normally. So if you've got a day of about 10 hours, you know you're going to get sort of 25 shots, yeah. 30 shots in that day. And it also, you know what uh, is important. And I've made this mistake before where you start off the day and you do six takes of the wide shot of the car pulling up outside the house. And then by the time you get to the end of the day where you've got the scene where the, you know, the, the father's crying and the mother's trying to do something and it's all the big emotional character stuff, you've got 10 minutes to do it. Yeah. Because you spent too long on the stuff at the beginning. So it's about going, do you know what? I've got enough here. This is fine. I can cut around that. And knowing how you, what you're going to use in the edit, um, and on a wide shot, you know, if you're going to do your coverage, if you've got a four-minute scene of a wide shot of people eating dinner or whatever, and you know you're going to come into the close-up shots, chances are that's where your action's going to be. So on the wide shot, you don't need every single line from every single actor around that table to be pitch perfect. And I've been there where a director's walked over on take six, going. Uh, Sarah, when you say your line, can you tweet your inflection so you look at your da da da? And it's like, well, you know you're going to be on the close up for that. Don't worry about it being on the wide. And if there's a if there's this part of the wide shot where someone gets up and walks across, or someone comes in, the butler comes in with the tray or whatever, then yes, make sure that that bit is good on the wide shot because chances are you're going to be using that particular tape because it gives us the geography of someone else entering the scene. But if it's someone crying then, you know, we're going to be on that in the close-up. So spend your time that on that, not on the wide shot or, you know, 100 yeah. takes of the keys going down on the floor or whatever <laughs> because they didn't fall right. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. Yeah, I've been in that room before and I've, <laughs> I've done it 12 times. Yeah, we've done it. We've been in the edit suite. We've got six takes of someone looking at their watch. And we, I don't know why we went to six for some particular reason. And then in the end, we've gone, oh, take two is pretty good. Yeah, like, why do we that? have to have another yeah. four? <laughs> that's such good, that's great advice. Thank you so much. We're actually nearly out of time. We've been chatting for so long. It's great. Crazy. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, basically, um, we just wanted to reiterate the fact that the, 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 the stories, uh, part of Silver Tip Films and our festival is that we really like great stories. So, again, just to reiterate, if you are going to be putting a film in or as Paul has said like it's all about the stories so make sure you make it simple um, and that's what we love um, and if you do the flower shop idea credit me yes exactly yeah um, put me in it maybe um, <laughs> um, so yeah please uh, make sure you check out um, Paul's book making your first blockbuster and his other book as well um, which is shooting better movies uh, which um, is they're both fantastic so much in here like I can't wait to see the films that you guys make from from reading um, so we've got to, Paul, we've got to pick somebody for your, for the, for the comments. Okay, we're going to decide that now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we had some pretty good ones. All right. I, I've got a favourite. Oh, all right. Let's hear them then. <laughs> I don't know what you think. Um, but I think we've had quite a lot of questions as well from this lovely gentleman. So I don't know if you think that his, his is pretty good, but the comment that he made was, um, working on my very first sci-fi feature film on a minuscule budget. I believe your book would be an amazing resource for building my knowledge around visual effects, creation and creating action. What do you think? Very good. What are, we, <laughs> what are the others? Thanks, Graham. Um, so, yeah, we've got um, uh, bits about um, just really, enjoy, really wanting to um, use your book. Um, and uh, I think that's probably one of the main ones. Yeah, I think, I think Graham's is a bit more... It's just Graham. Hey, oh, I thought we had another one there. It's a one-horse race. Graham it's a wins. one-horse race, Graham. Sorry, I was trying. I'm sure we had another one, so I was trying to find out where it was. Um, but I think that was Richard. Um, but Graham, yeah, I think. What do you think, Paul? I think we should give him the book. Oh, uh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. 
Thank you, Graham. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Um, and yeah, that was it. Was really great to meet you, Paul. Thank you. Um, for I've me. I learned so much from you, so I hope everyone else has too. Um, and make sure you, you check out the book.